Consider yourself lucky if you've never been woken up by a tornado alarm. One minute, you're in a deep sleep, dreaming about a better world. And the next, you're being confronted with a waking nightmare. When those alarms go off, you only have a few minutes to wake from your stupor. Gather your family and get to a safe space. A twister could be down the street or across town. You won't know until it either blows your house down or enough time passes that you feel confident that it missed you. In the meantime, you and yours huddle in a closet or a cellar and pray. It's a hazard that I've lived with for most of my life. When you grow up in a part of the country colorfully named Tornado Alley, you learn to live with the storms. I've been lucky that one as it destroyed my house, but I've had a few close shaves. If you've ever seen the power of a massive funnel cloud up close, it never leaves your brain. Watching the natural world destroy nearly indestructible buildings is a fun reminder that Mother Nature is our landlord and people are just the residents on this planet. We can be evicted at any moment. The screeching alarms are as much a part of summer as the crack of a bat and the buzzing of cicadas. They help make up the milieu of Midwest living. The alarm systems are automated and they go off when conditions indicate a potential storm. Even if there isn't a twister, the alarms are a signal that something terrible is approaching. It could be a pounding hailstorm, a weird green sky, or flooding from intense and ceaseless rainfall. Regardless if the alarms are blaring, some bad stuff is coming your way. This time was worse than all those other times combined. My day had been a pleasant one. The weather was warm, so we spent the day playing in the yard and taking a dip in our pool. It's an above-ground number that we got at a discount, but the water was cool and that's all that mattered. My littlest is still learning and my oldest loves to jump in, so it was a balancing act trying to get both sides to work together. It can be frustrating, but these micro-negotiations were the purview of parenting. It comes with the turf. As afternoon turned into evening, Cindy, my wife, played soccer with the kids while I cooked some burgers on the grill and enjoyed a drink or two. The weather was so perfect that we ate outside under our spreading oak tree. My son left his scraps for the ants and I was sure the amount of food that he left would fill the ant's storage quota for the summer. After the sun went down and we put the kids to bed, Cindy and I lay in our hammock, watching the stars and talking about nothing and everything. It's an odd way to think about it, but it was one of those days you'll think about on your deathbed, a moment in time you'll lovingly return to when you're about to cross into the next life. It'll bring a smile to your face at a time when that should seem impossible. When we went to bed a few hours later, the temperature had cooled and there was a slight breeze blowing. Still, there was absolutely no indication of storms on the horizon. When you're in an area where it rains frequently, you can develop a sixth sense of when a storm is coming. You can feel subtle changes in your body. If a distant storm is intense enough, you can smell the petrichor in the air. The smell of dried dirt mingling with rainwater lets you know what kind of torment is coming. But there was none of that. We slept with everything as calm as possible in this rolling modern world. The perfect capstone to the perfect day. One for the ages. And then the tornado siren started blaring. When you become a parent, any thought of being a deep sleeper goes out the window. Nature takes away your ability to sleep deeply when you have to take care of little ones. That said, the alarm was loud enough to wake the dead. I sat up in an instant, my eyes open, but the fuzz of the dream world is still clouded at the edges of my vision. A tornado, Cindy asked, rubbing the sleep from her eyes. Yeah, I think so. I'll grab the kids. I said, swinging my legs out of bed. Before I could hit the door, I heard the running of two little bodies down the hallway. The sirens had also brought the kids in from the land of Nod. 
They both were scared and you could see the fear in their tiny faces. They both ran past me and hopped under the blankets with my wife. I grabbed my phone and I looked for an alert from the National Weather Service, but there was nothing. I did a Google search for tornado warnings in my area and I came up with the same. I hauled my body out of bed and I walked to the back slider. I didn't see any rain falling. I opened the door and confirmed that there wasn't even the distant rumble of thunder. But that alarm was steady. It would rise in tone and decibels and then fall again before starting over. If you listened closely, you could hear the different alarms going off further away. It was like they were singing the world's most annoying song in the round. I closed the door and walked back into my bedroom. Cindy was getting the gear ready to go into our shelter when I said to stop. She was confused. Why? There isn't any storm. What? Yeah, I said. There are some scattered clouds, but they're not thunderheads or anything. But the alarms, she said. Maybe it's a malfunction. I hope not, seeing as working tornado alarms are important. I know, I said. But there isn't even a stiff breeze right now. It's just like when we came inside last night. Still and cool, but calm. Now, should we go to the shelter for a little bit just in case something is forming and we can't see it? I thought about it and it wasn't a bad idea. Yes, the kids would have their night interrupted and would have a hard time falling back to sleep. Yeah, the lack of sleep might also make them little goblins in the morning. Yeah, I was probably being overly cautious. But the downside of being wrong could be death. That was a little worse than kids being grumpy in the morning. I agreed and sent them down into the shelter to wait it out but decided to stay upstairs for now. Our phones worked for crap in the shelter under the house. If I was going to find any new information, I would have to stay above ground for the time being. I helped everybody downstairs and I closed up the shelter. I promised Cindy and the kids that I would join them if things went sideways. I wouldn't dawdle or try to get a good video. I tend to do so. I would be under the house as fast as they could say tornado. If you linger, I'll come grab your butt, storm or no storm. Oh, trust me, I know. I said, giving her a kiss on the forehead. Once my family was safely under the house, I went out to my porch. The alarms were still blaring and it was obvious that my family wasn't the only one awake. Down the darkened street, I could see the porch lights pop on like man-made lightning bugs. What the heck is this? I heard somebody say in the yard next to me. It was my neighbor Rick. And despite being on the tail end of the boomer generation, Rick seemed to swim against the tide. He was more rooted in Gen X than anything. Whenever we would talk outside, he would constantly complain about the old people in our town, as if he was blind to his own receding hairline and wrinkles. Busted alarm, I offered. What? he yelled. I moved closer to him to avoid hollering into the night. Maybe a busted alarm or someone accidentally scheduled a test for 3 in the morning instead of in the afternoon. I don't know, those tests are all controlled by computers. I don't think they would make that kind of mistake. Besides, they would have shut them down by now if it was an accident. I mean, there are some clouds up there. You think a storm is brewing? Not according to the weather birds, Rick said. The weather birds were a local group of weather nerds and storm chasers that he belonged to. There isn't much to do where we live, so we find hobbies wherever possible. They said a good cell was hanging out in North Texas, but it wasn't coming this way. I wonder what gives, I said. The government, said a voice to my right. And this was my other neighbor, John. John was very much a boomer and proud of it too. He was a former Marine and hated everything about modern living. As you can imagine, any of my kids' toys that ended up on his lawn... He instantly seized until I went and asked nicely for it. Every time that he would lecture me, I would apologize until he gave my kids frisbee or whatever. It was exhausting. I mean, the weather alert system is run by the government, Rick said. 
and deep state government, Rick. The bad guys, John said with a sneer. They're up to something. Their master plan includes setting off a false tornado alarm in the middle of the night in the middle of nowhere. I asked. Juan, this isn't the middle of nowhere. Breadbasket of the country and home to several nuclear missile launch sites. John barked. Two, the alarms are a way to set us off balance, to confuse us. If we're focusing on the alarms, we're not watching what they're really doing. Oh, which is? Rick asked in a mix of confusion and amusement. Land clearance. They'll drive us out of here and reclaim our land. Why would they do that? I asked. John just laughed. Boy, you just don't get it, do you? Your whole generation is out to lunch. Well, actually, my whole generation has to work through our lunch breaks. I said, unable to resist the dig. They want to build a re-education center here. Turn real patriots into brain-dead automatons that'll do whatever they tell us to do. Then the government can control us. That'll be when it gets really interesting. Where did you hear that at? Rick asked. I did my own research. John said defensively. Wait, you're against government control now. Rick asked, doubling down. I always have been, he snapped. You guys want to keep your heads in the sand about where we're going as a people, then fine. But society can't take these kind of changes and not pay a consequence for them. If you let the rock creep in, it'll take over. How does any of this connect to the tornado alarm? I said, feeling the exhaustion of the late night talk with John. Clay had warned us about this. He said the stormtroopers would come at night and lock us up. I'm worried this might be the start of something big. I'll grant you this. If they wanted to ensure the citizens they rolled up wouldn't be alarmed, a tornado alarm in the middle of the night would be a way to do it. I said. John laughed. Speak for yourself, he said, raising his shirt to expose a handgun tucked into his pajama pants. What the heck, man, I said. I'll never be caught off guard, he said with a smile. Old Pete and I go everywhere together. Let one of these stormtroopers come around here. I'll blast him where he stands. You both can thank me later. The screaming tornado alarm suddenly went quiet. You could hear the echo in your mind, but the typical night noises returned to the world outside our gray matter. The crickets reigned supreme again. We all looked at each other in delighted amazement. Guess it wasn't stormtroopers after all, I said. Rick laughed, John didn't. Above us, we heard an eardrum bursting boom. It was like a bomb went off above our heads, only we hadn't seen anything streak by. That was a sonic boom, John said. Seconds later, we heard a different type of boom. Whatever had flown over us had exploded. You could just barely make out the orange flames in the dark clouds. Ah, Jesus, tap dance in Christ. John said, removing his cap and placing it over his heart. What the heck is that? I said, pointing up at the sky. Breaking through the clouds with a white parachute, it was drifting so violently from side to side that I feared it would tip over and send the occupant plunging to the earth. Whoever was strapped to the chute wasn't steering anything. They were dropping right towards our street. There was another sonic boom over our heads, quickly followed by another explosion. Seconds later, another white flower bloomed in the sky. Like their compatriot, they looked zonked out of their southward descent. The first parachuting pilot showed no signs of slowing and landing harder on the ground than they should have. As soon as their legs hit the pavement of the road, you could hear the sickening snap of both legs. That woke the pilot up. The man screamed so loud that I was afraid he would break glass. Rick had been a paramedic in his younger years and ran over to the pilot to help him in any way that he could. The pilot frantically ripped his helmet and reached for his broken legs, but his harness wouldn't let him grab them. It was for the best. His legs had broken at the shin and they were barely attached. Hey man, I know it hurts, but stop thrashing around. You're going to make it worse, okay? 
We can save the legs, but you need to listen. Rick said in a more confident and serious tone than I had ever heard him. We're all done, the pilot said, his eyes wide. That thing isn't going to let any of us live. Just put a bullet into me. Shoot me. Shoot me. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw John look up. I was worried that he would acquiesce to the pilot's request, but instead he smacked the guy across the face. The pilot's frantic motions and screaming had stopped. You're in the uniform, act like it, John said. He nodded at Rick. Let this man do his job, okay? The pilot, still dazed, just nodded. He looked over at John and we locked eyes. I hated the dude, but that was pretty clutch. I gave him a nod and he returned the favor. Rick was able to unhitch the pilot from his ejector seat and lay him on the ground. He went to work, making a splint as best he could. About a dozen people tried to call 911, but their phones didn't work. They couldn't find a signal. Suddenly, the power in the entire neighborhood went out. We were standing in the pitch black darkness when we heard the second pilot land in the street with another snap of their legs. The screams that followed echoed through the quiet neighborhood. Paul? I heard a familiar voice call out. It was Cindy and she was standing with my children on the side of the house. I had dawdled and she was true to her word. Paul, what's going on? I... I never got to finish that thought. From above us came a bassy trumpet blast that did shatter glass. Everybody grabbed their ears and squatted to the ground as if that would make it disappear. I felt my internal organs vibrating. It was unsettling. After the longest 10 seconds of my life, the trumpet blast had stopped. I looked over at my kids and they were sobbing. Cindy did everything she could to hold them together. I ran over, my legs wobbly from the noise, and I hugged them tightly. Daddy, what's going on? My son had asked, sobbing. I don't know, I said, deciding that honesty was better than not. Is something coming for us? My daughter said, fear rising in her voice. No, baby, I don't think so. I gave her a tight hug. My eyes looked up until they locked with Cindy's panic-stricken face. I won't let anything happen to you. Who are those guys? My son said, pointing at the two wounded pilots. Pilots? Well, where are their planes? A ball the size of a compact car came hurtling toward the ground. Everybody on the street screamed and ran for cover. The debris slammed into the Anderson home ten houses down, sending a shockwave that swept everybody off their feet. I stood in time to see a second ball hurtling toward our neighborhood. I dove over my family and shielded them as the metal ball slammed into John's house. It instantly exploded, and flames started eating away the home. I laid on them until the dust from the explosion had settled. Once I was sure that there wasn't anything else raining down on us, I got to my feet. My vision was hazy from the dust in the air but I had a clear view of the ball that had destroyed at John's house. It was one of the jets. Something in the clouds had crumbled up a half billion dollar weapon of war like it was a kid's a paper airplane. That thing isn't natural, the first pilot screamed. This isn't the first attack, the second one yelled. They're come for you all, run, run before they come after you. The night sky was again broken by the bone-rattling bass of that horn blowing. Again, we all dropped and covered our ears again. The horn stopped but echoed for ten seconds before it finally dissipated. We all craned our necks and retreated to an explosion of red, blue, green, and yellow lights illuminating the clouds. At first blush, it looked random, but it wasn't. It was a pattern. The pattern repeated two more times and then everything went dark. It was silent and calm again. All the sounds of the natural world rushed back to your ears. The crickets continued their symphonies and a gentle breeze blew. It would be idyllic if it weren't for the raging house fires, the panic-stricken pilots and 
the balled-up aircraft next to me. Is that it? I said out loud to the universe. I heard a rumbling coming down our street. My emotions couldn't take any more shock, but I was bracing for whatever the heck was coming. I was ready to sprint and hide with my family if I needed to. Soon the humming of dozens of engines filled our ears. The bright yellow headlights of the lead truck illuminated the street. There were dozens of pairs behind them. I was worried this was an invading force, but relaxed when I saw an American flag on the side of the trucks. The stars and stripes of the military vehicles put my mind at ease, for a second anyway. And then the inevitable question popped into my mind. Cindy beat me to the punch. What the heck is the army doing here? She asked. I don't know. The line of trucks came to a halt. The engines idled and the noise drowned out the crickets. Even though it was dark, you could still see the exhaust puffing into the air. After a beat, the passenger side of the lead truck popped open, and a high-ranking army official exited the vehicle. He clutched a bullhorn in one hand and a walkie-talkie in the other. Seeing the wounded pilots, he whispered something into his walkie-talkie. Seconds later, we heard the doors of an ambulance open and men marching with medical gear to retrieve the pilots. Rick tried to help, but he was pushed aside. He didn't argue, just took a step back. The medical men stabbed the pilots with some sort of pain medication because they both stopped talking and slumped over in the stretchers. Seconds later, they were placed in the back of an ambulance and gone from our sight. The army official looked at the gathered group of people and raised his bullhorn. In a loud and gruff voice, he spoke. Many of you are probably wondering what happened here. It's my job to inform you that there has been an accident in the skies above your town. Two American pilots experienced a catastrophic failure and their planes were destroyed. The United States Armed Forces will compensate everybody for this unfortunate error. If your house has been destroyed, please contact our intelligence agents who will gather your information. Again, the United States Armed Forces apologizes for this event. Thank you. He lowered his bullhorn. Oh, what were they engaging with? Rick asked. The crowd around him suddenly found their courage and demanded answers. The official raised the bullhorn again. They did not encounter anything. Their jet systems malfunctioned and they crashed. That's a lie, Rick yelled. I understand that this is a lot to take in at once, but we are here to help you, the official said. This was a malfunction on the jets that had caused the crash. I had heard enough. I took a few steps toward the official and pointed at the bald up remains of the jet. Something crushed that freaking plane like it was a potato chip. It's in the shape of a ball, for God's sake. The pilots were screaming about something coming to kill us. What is that about? Rick said, his anger rising with the crowds. This group of neighbors and block party participants were rounding into an angry mob right before our eyes. They were in shock from the trauma, the official said. Oftentimes, a pain will make you say things. No, it doesn't, Rick said. I worked in trauma hospitals my whole life. Nobody ever starts ranting about government conspiracies when they get hurt. What aren't you telling us? We are telling you the truth. Well, I think he's lying, I screamed. The crowd cheered in agreement. There was a palpable anger growing in the crowd. And the official must have sensed it too, because he glanced back at the convoy of trucks and gave a curt nod. Suddenly, every door opened and full armed soldiers got out and fell into formation behind him. You can't intimidate us. You can't force a lie into us. We know what we saw. He raised his bullhorn again. You are mistaken, sir. Hallucination is a side effect of exposure to the chemicals from the exploded jet. I recommend you all go into your homes and wait until our cleanup crews can ensure that the spill is contained. At once, every soldier flipped off their safeties. The message was clear. 
go and forget this happened or else. And despite the implied threat, something in me snapped. Instead of being cowed, I took another step toward the soldiers. I picked up a rock and I hurled it at the jet. It rang off the metal. That's not a hallucination. That's real. I said pointing up at the sky. Whatever the heck up there did it, this was real too. We heard the noise, we saw the lights. It set off the tornado alarms. Sir, I advise you and your family to return to your home. A gunshot rang out. For a second, everybody froze in place. I was worried that the soldiers would open fire on us. I felt my resolve drain from me in that moment of impending death. I looked over and realized that John had let old Pete join the conversation. The old marine stood with a pissed off scowl on his face and a smoking gun aimed at the sky. What about my home? I looked over and was surprised to see John walking toward the soldiers as angry as I had ever seen him. It's gone. As I said, the official started. John fired another shot in the air to silence him. The soldiers trained their guns on John but had a subtle hand gesture from the official that kept the bullets from flying. I gave everything for this country, for the constitution, for freedom. I gave my youth a fighting for this country, side to side with brothers in arms. I watched friends die. I knew the government was full of it but I always believed the military was a safeguard. But now, this is the crap you're going to pull on us. This is how you treat a fellow service member. Thank you for your service, the official said. I'll blow it, John retorted. The crowd went nuts. We all started yelling and massing. Cindy grabbed at me, but I turned and told her to take the kids inside. She opened her mouth to protest, but stopped when we had locked eyes. It was righteous indignation. I had to see this through. She grabbed my kids and rushed them back into the safety of the house. The official gave another signal, and three soldiers aimed their weapons into the air and fired off a few dozen rounds. The crowd went silent so quickly that you could hear the shell casing at the concrete. It sounded like a baby playing a xylophone. The crowd stopped advancing. The official ignored the rest of us and focused all his attention on John. I understand your frustration, but if you were a good soldier, you would remember the chain of command. The official said, nodding to his rank, a designation on his shoulder. Good soldiers follow rank. You are a good soldier, right? And that caught John. He paused and you could see him mulling the words over in his mind. This man had acquiesced to power his whole life. Heck, he had been a tool of it for most of his adult years. Now for the first time he was challenging it. John saw himself as an honorable man, a loyal man, not a rabble rouser or something like that. We all waited for him to respond with bated breath. And then the rain started falling. Or, I thought it was rain, but when it hit my arm it burned. Each drop sizzled as it hit our skin. A person in the crowd looked and a drop hit them square in the eye. They screamed in pain and fell to the ground, clutching their face. It was like some kind of acid was falling on us. Oh crap, the official said, all of his bluster fleeing at once. They seeded the clouds, they're coming. Everybody, back inside the vehicles. All of the soldiers hustled back inside their trucks. The official gave the crowd a look and yelled, Get inside, now! Before he took off for the safety of his truck. I turned and ran for my house, and as I did, a trumpet blast sent a shockwave that created a small earthquake. I tripped and fell, the falling rain stinging my exposed neck. My ears rang from the blast, but I wove myself into the house. As soon as I had entered the door, I stripped off my clothes and tossed them outside. The rain had started to eat through the fabric. I wrapped myself in a throw blanket and rushed to the window to watch the scene unfolding in front of us. I was surprised to see John still standing out there. He hadn't moved from that spot. 
It was like the decision to go against his core beliefs had caused a malfunction in his brain. As he had aged, his beliefs had curdled into conspiracy. The force he thought was a bulwark against his dreaded deep state now seemed to be working in concert with it. It was too much room to bear. He stood there and let the rain eat him away piece by piece. He didn't even scream as his skin sloughed off his body. Instead, he raised old Pete to his temple and he pulled the trigger. I slammed the blind shut and turned away. Reality had broken through. We were in real danger. I grabbed my family and went to the back of the house. We would ride out whatever was happening and pray that it didn't get worse. My kids asked me to explain what was going on, but I didn't find an answer that wouldn't make things worse. I instead hugged them tight and told them that I loved them. All I could hear outside was the rain, or whatever it actually was, falling on the roof. I prayed that it wouldn't eat through the shingles. I knew there was probably a beehive's worth of activity going on outside with the military there, but still my rational brain had returned to me. I no longer cared about anything but surviving the night. We stayed that way for two hours. At some point, the adrenaline wore off and the three of them fell asleep. I couldn't though because my mind was still reeling. But more than that, I felt the energy around me shift. I felt my mind start to slip. I've written all this down because I think something is messing with my mind. And I wanted to share my story in case I go crazy or something. I wanted to make sure that I got the details just right in case my brain is liquefying or something. I don't know what's waiting for us tomorrow morning, but I'm not sure I'll even make it until then. As soon as I got inside, I started feeling a tickling sensation down my arms and legs. It's like somebody was dragging their fingernails down my skin. I think this has to do with that rain because no one else in my house had mentioned feeling that. The rain never fell on them. In the last 10 minutes or so, I've started noticing moving black shadows in the corners of my vision. When I look at the figures, they disappear, but they return. They always return. I can sense them watching me. I don't know what they are or what they want, but I'm sure they're not here for a cup of coffee. I can feel my eyes growing heavy, but I'm afraid to sleep. I'm worried they'll come for me then. I'm so scared that I'll end up like John. I'm feeling my strength drain from me. I'm drifting now, powering down. I see them emerging from the shadows. Oh God.